Hey Seattle. Hey Nginxers. How's the city treating you? It's a pretty cool place, right? Great thing for me coming to Conf, fifth time, I can't believe it, is that for, as an out of towner and out of country, for someone who lives in the UK, I get the opportunity to come and visit a cool new city in the US. And I flew in to Seattle on Friday. This is me right at the back of my plane. And I thought to myself, ah, Seattle again. I've been here quite a lot recently. And uh, mostly in that building right there. It's a pretty cool building, but I prefer to come to a new city, but next year. And so last year, we were in Atlanta. And approximately 12 months ago, I was on this stage, and I was able to announce and demo live on stage the new API management module for NGX controller. Right? It's a great moment. We had a new product. Here it is. If you've ever demoed a product, like Jason just did, live on stage, you'll know that it is a mildly terrifying experience. Right? Every button you press, every knob you turn, could it end up with a, some sort of technical disaster. But it went pretty well. Because between you and a successful demo, a smiley face presenter and a happy web UI, you need to rely on a whole bunch of things. Definitely hotel Wi-Fi. We're all struggling with that this week. The internet, probably a VPN. Definitely some cloud, and therefore somebody else's computer. And on top of all that, you probably have to rely on some pre-release software that's not been through the every last little level of detail in the QA process. Maybe it's on some engineering branch. Yeah, you live in wild. And so as I stood there on the stage in Atlanta and the demo was going, OK, I told myself, Liam, never again. But you've been promised a demo. I'm wearing my lucky demo shirt. <laughs> so demo it is. So we voted on after conf. Product team got busy. And we launched the API management module for NHS controller back in Q1 this year. The great thing about releasing a new product is that overnight, the level, the quality, the depth of conversations that you have with customers goes up by an order of magnitude, by several orders of magnitude. Right, it's a great thing. Because until you launch, you're a prisoner. Now, I've been launching software since 1994 when I was a little student, and I, I sent my uh, a brand new web application that ran on Mosaic web browser yeah, before Netscape, six months before Netscape. And I posted on the news group, www.infosystem.announce, something like that. Hey, I've just done this website. Here it is, world. Go and check it out. Please send me feedback. Right? Feedback is unbelievably important. I got feedback. People actually came and used a thing that I put on the internet. I couldn't quite believe it, because I was just a 20-year-old student knocking stuff out in my spare time on you know, the internet as it, was, as it was growing up. But I got feedback. People asked me for the source code, which I thought was also surprising. I didn't know anything about open source, but I sent by email source code. And people sent me back fixes and improvements and enhancements in this thing, little rubbish, little quiz-type website, grew a little bit and got better. Because while you're building a new piece of software, while you're building a product, as I said, you're a prisoner. You would love to have conversations with customers. Right? But do they want to talk to you about something that you didn't yet ship? There's other stuff they can go and do. Right? They have more important things than talking about something that they don't know for sure is going to happen. Right? The best you can hope for is that a customer comes and you know, does talk to you in some special way. And I liken this to you're a prisoner. They sit down. You've got you know, rubbish audio, very difficult to have a conversation. You've got a you know, dirty pane of glass in front of you. Everything is filtered. Nothing is super accurate. You can do all the focus groups you want. You can do surveys. You can you know, look at industry analysts, uh, other vendors' products. But nothing is as important as actually shipping and then people telling you what they really think.
And so what became very clear when we started talking to customers and they started using the API management module for controller was the sheer scale, significance, and importance of the API programs in these customers' organizations, right, especially when part of a microservices initiative. Often related to microservices, often unlocking data silos inside organizations, whether it be for internal consumption or for a partner consumption or for a pure public external consumption, and definitely enabling agility, speed, and digital transformation. IDC recently had a survey of 500 respondents across all the uh, market sectors and found that 60% of those organizations already have deployed and considered themselves an API-first organization with an API management solution already deployed and in production. That's 60% across most market segments today. And overwhelmingly, what you've told us as our customers is that in order for these API programs to be successful, we need to give developers, those actually consuming the APIs, implementing business logic, building applications, we need to give the developers the information, everything they need to be successful in those endeavors. And to me, nothing better articulates the way that software is eating the world than how we empower developers and optimize API programs for good developer experience. Because developer experience is a thing. And so as we accelerated our plans to build a developer portal to help achieve those goals. Now, primarily, a developer portal does two things. Firstly, it's an inventory. It's a catalog. Right? It lists all the APIs that are available, those that are being published, right? so you know what's available. And secondly, it provides documentation about what each of those APIs is able to achieve, how to consume them as a developer, how you go about it. So let's see that in action. Before I start, a reminder of all the things that need to work for this to go well. OK, finish the demo. Cool. All right. Let's sign in here. So we're looking, logging into controller. I'll use my demo account. OK, log straight in. First thing I see here are the instances that are running data plane for not only my API gateways, and I have a, a modestly simple configuration for maximum success, uh, but I also have a developer portal. Right? So the dev portal is just another instance managed by controller. We'll see more of that later. And I've got one API gateway running happily here, not very busy. So we'll switch over to the API management tab. And here we've got a couple of APIs that we're already publishing. We can see that we're ostensibly a sports data service. We've got a golf stats API. We've got a baseball stats API. So let's take a quick look at what's going on here. So these, by the way, have backends. They have an entry point, which is the uh, the, the place by which clients, API clients, come and reach these APIs. So there's a host name there, sports.example.com. We can run some traffic through that. And we can see that it's running a TLS and port 443, the one API gateway that I just showed you, and that it's publishing two code environments, one for the golf app, one for the baseball app. Right. And so when we look at those API definitions, let's take golf. Right. It's got a name. It's got a base path where we might start addressing this, the beginning, the prefix for this API. And it's got a couple of simple resources about players, about courses. And one significant feature of our API management module is that we completely decouple definition of the API from how it's published on the network. And we do this for two reasons. Firstly, because your API definition is not usually going to be entered uh, through a user interface. You've probably got that defined and documented elsewhere. So you want to be able to import an existing API specification. That's also coming. Secondly, we might publish the same API in different places. right? You might publish different versions of that API in different places. And the policies 
that we attach to different runtime environments vary. Dev environment maybe doesn't use TLS. Production absolutely does. And so we don't conflate the policies required to run traffic with the API definition, how it's described. So if we look at our environment for production, and we'll skip over the absence of policies, we'll see that we've got the same two resources that we had to begin with, and they're routed to my golf app. Same goes for my baseball stats. Right? So that's got a couple of resources. It's got three, in fact, players, games, and teams, and they're routed to my baseball app. And both baseball and golf are published on the sports.example.com. So we promised you a dev portal. So dev portal.example.com. So here's the first, first view of the dev portal for our API management module. It's currently skinned as an internal Nginx API. So everything you see here is going to be skinnable, brandable, so that it fits the way that the applications, the APIs that you're publishing uh, match your corporate brand, whether that's for an internal internet style dev portal or whether this is for external APIs facing the outside world. And so the two APIs that I got published appear here in the dev portal. We've got Golf, and we'll see that we start to take advantage of that decoupling of the API definition and the way that it's on the network by combining the production specification for this API with the definition that we have. So for example, the servers exists on sports.example.com. Right? It might exist on a different portal on a different URI. And this is also where we can bring to bear information about best practice about acceptable use, what the rate limit is for consuming this particular API or particular resources. So all of the policies that we can apply as we publish an API, we can bring into the dev portal as a live piece of documentation that accurately reflects how the API exists in production, how it should be consumed. And of course, as well as that, the API definition itself, those resources that we saw for courses, for players, have more information about the rest request methods that are acceptable for these endpoints, and an example payload if it's a post, and an example response if it's, uh, if it's a get. So here we've got players. Example response might be Tiger Woods with a handicap of six. I know nothing about golf. It's probably quite good. Let's see the real value of the dev portal in the way that it automatically will update based on changes that we make to the APIs that we're publishing. So head back to controller. And let's do a couple of things. Let's look at our APIs. Let's add another resource. Right? So let's take golf. And let's edit the golf API definition. Let's add a new resource. So we've got courses. We've got players. What else might we want to get? All right. Results. There we go. All right. Let's do a get. We're going to get the results. We might also create a post here. If we were to do a post, we might be creating a new result for maybe a new tournament. And then in that place, we might uh, require a sample request, a payload you know, with the data. So keep it simple. Let's do a get. And we'll say that we're going to add a sample response. So we're starting to augment the endpoints for this API definition with additional information that a developer needs in order to consume it. So a successful response is HTTP 200. That means OK. And our sample response might look something like uh, winner, Liam. If I played golf, I'd probably be pretty good at it. Now, notice one thing. We added additional resource to the API definition, but we didn't publish it. We didn't add a route to it. So we have a warning that we have edited, and we have one unrouted resource. So let's fix that by editing this combination of the API definition and where it's published. Add a route. Let's pick up uh, the results, route it to the Golf app. Terrific. Tell you what else we can do. How about a whole new API? I'm going to tell you a sport that I do know something about. Formula One results. And should we have a racing car emoji? Because as I said yesterday, everything's better with an emoji. All right, API F1. All right, I'll save your description. Cool. 
Now let's see if that actually got done. Should we give that one more go? Boo. Is it coming back? All right. I'm going to do a quick little, uh, let me see if we can still got the dev portal, first of all. Ladies and gentlemen, we have network connectivity problems. <laughs> and you know what? I will give this one go on the Wi-Fi, and we'll, uh, I'll tell you what magic would happen. Who knew Wi-Fi is more reliable than the uh, Ethernet today? Thank you very much. All right, let's just reload that. OK, there's controller. I'll spare you the emoji. All right. Cool. Now, uh, drivers might be a good example. So well, let's add a response to that too. And OK, an, ex you know, an example driver might have a name. There's another one. All right. Cool. Now let's have an environment too. Of course, everything I'm doing today is in production. Save that. Let's use the entry point. So I'm going to publish this API. Guess what? On the same API gateway. Publish through the sports.example.com. I'm going to have as many APIs as I like on my entry point. That's done. I could add some policies here. I could add rate limits. I could add authentication policies, the stuff that you need to make APIs run reliably in production. But for now, let's just keep it simple. All right. I'm just going to route that to my F1 app. And now we're publishing. And actually, we're publishing both the update that I made to the, uh, to the baseball API, or was it golf, uh, and also the new F1 API. So, and what's happening is that's not only updating the data plane, the API gateway, or gateways, if you have HA that's running this, but we're also updating the dev portal, which sometimes gets cached. So dev portal updated in real time with the new F1 results API with my driver's resource and the example response that a developer knows what to expect when he consumes the slash driver's endpoint, the URL that it's published on, the port, the base path, and if we look into golf results, we will see that if I was playing golf, I'd be a winner, just like winning at demos. So we've got a lot more to come in the dev portal. As you can see, there's some you know, buttons around here that I'm deliberately not clicking on in terms of signing up for accounts, being able to issue authentication credentials so that those private authenticated APIs, developers can come sign up, get the tokens they need, and embed those in requests so that they're getting authenticated access without having to trouble the help desk to set that up, backed by the workflows you need to be able to authorize and authenticate such workflows, the developers, and giving the developers the results, the metrics, and the reports they need to see how their APIs are, how their applications, consumers' APIs, are actually being used in production. So we've got a lot to come. You will see the dev portal arriving in the next major release of controller. So that's the demo. If I can switch back to the slides. And just remember the th all the things that we had to deal with to get that demo working. As I've mentioned, a central design philosophy for how the API management module for controller works is that we decouple the control plane where you do the configuration from the data plane, the Nginx Plus instances that are operating as an API gateway. So you do your configuration in one place, and the traffic management happens somewhere else. And of course, we extend this philosophy to developer portal. So you want to have an intranet-style developer portal publishing your internal APIs. Awesome, no problem. You want to have an external API dev portal for the external APIs that you're publishing. That's great too. You want to put the external dev portal in someone else's cloud so that it's completely separated 
from the traffic, the production runtime traffic, maybe in your, in your DMZ. Great, we can do that too. So this loose coupling, lightweight approach to how we build our controller and all the associated components flows from data plane to dev portal. And as a product team, when we were looking at how we were going to run the technology, what the stack was going to look like to serve this documentation, have a searchable list of APIs, have that catalog functionality, have people able to sign up for accounts. We looked in the market for a lightweight web server that had you know, best of breed capabilities, one that was super fast, and one that had a decent amount of market share. And of course, we didn't have to look very far because you may have missed it. But earlier this year, back in April, Nginx outpaced Apache to be the number one web server on the internet. And it's just amazing to be able to build a product that we can use Nginx for so many different pieces of that, of that product. And the components are always first class. And so I think it's fitting in this milestone year for Nginx as we continue on as F5 that this humble web server uh, has achieved uh, a certain amount of greatness. And my, uh, I tip my hat to Igor for, uh, for kicking it all off. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>